Welcome back to the gospel. We have an excellent show in store for you today. So much happened over the weekend, and some of what happened on the weekend uh, kind of brought about a couple other changes that we have to talk about as well. A few firings, a few people on the hot seat. The first college, the first official college rankings, we'll go over that with you as well. I am your Jose, the fantasy football fiend himself. I got my bros with me. The fantasy knows the Damage, young Vander. How let people, man? Hey, what's going on out there? And my guy, BK wins. BK, you have been giving us what is necessary to put a few ducats in our pocket. I, I hit two parlays based off of some of the advice that you gave on last week. Uh, so you guys make sure that you listen to this Friday show where we do uh, BK's best bets. But BK, how did the people? Hey, y'all. All righty. So uh, we've had another firing. Dennis Allen is no longer the head coach of the New Orleans Saints after their loss to the uh, Carolina Panthers, 23 to 22. This is not one that I saw coming, and I am very much sure, BK, that this is one that messed up a whole bunch of people's parlays out there this weekend that thought that was just going to be a gimme. What is the current state of the Saints? Do we think that they can recover? Uh, so first of all, if you've been following the betting advice, if there's two bad teams, that is an automatic stay away. If you're betting on the Saints and Panthers, that is a losing scenario. Never want to do that. That said, these Saints, not at all surprised that he got fired. His overall record, I believe, is 24 and 49 as head coach there. He had lost seven in a row after a 2-0 and start. Um you know, and when you lose to the Panthers, um, mm, like that, there's no coming back from that. It almost reminds me back to where their home games is going to turn back to the old late Tom Benson days where everyone would come to the games with wearing bags on their head. Like, I think that's where the fan base is at this point with this team. Like, they're really bad, really bad. And you lose to Carolina, and that's even worse. So, not at all surprised he got fired. The Falcons ends up beating Dallas 27-21. Dak is on IR. CD Lamb is hurt, but it looks like he may not be uh it may not be too big of an issue with him. But is there any way that Dallas can recover? What you got, Vander? No. <laughs> okay. Just, just, just that simple. I mean. They was already struggling with everybody aboard. So now that you have a backup quarterback, uh, your best wide receiver is a fall away from being out for the year. Things going to play with that AC joint, but lay on that shoulder wrong, he could be out of here as well. So um, the running game is obsolete. Uh, your best pass rusher, he's coming back hopefully this week. Um, but nah, I think this team is finished. I mean, They've been finished before it all started. And this is like the nail in the coffin at this point. I got to agree. Um, and it's, how would I say? It, it's not sad. It's almost our propos because we had this whole, we're going all in and their big move of the season was trading with the Carolina Panthers to bring in Jonathan Mingo to be a wide receiver there in Dallas. That's about all that they've done. Well, real quick, the, the, the crazy thing, I want to say something real quick on that. The crazy thing about that with Jerry is, I don't know, I don't know. I think he's the old age. Some of these things have caught up. I mean, you trade a fourth round pick for a Mingo. We just seen D Hop go for a fifth round pick. I mean, if you look at some of the guys that were picking the fourth round this past draft, yeah, the guy, the likes of, um, as Stemmy, uh, Ray Davis, the running back from uh, the Bills. Um, your running game is already obsolete. So you didn't uh, – Braylon Allen, the, 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 the big boy in the Jets. So we've seen some guys that you can put in your system and you didn't do anything of that as well. Uh, Derrick Henry lives in the Dallas area, Fort Worth area, wanted to come to your place. Now leading the league in rushing touchdown rushes you don't do nothing there so i mean they you get what you deserve at this point 
Yeah, and just to piggyback on that, you know, I had mentioned before the season started, Zay, when you and I were breaking down all the teams, that I know Cowboys fans didn't want to hear this, but the Cowboys are in rebuilding mode. It's obvious they they did next to nothing in the offseason, and then you retain Mike McCarthy. So if you're not signing anybody in the offseason and you're keeping an awful coach, that literally tells me that you're not trying to win. Like, actions speak louder than words. You can say that you're all in, but if you're not making any moves and you keep an awful coach, who are you fooling? Certainly not any of us. He's fooling the Dallas faithful who seem to be willing to be fooled. Um, right. that's, that's basically what, it, it don't matter what move Jerry Jones makes. It's, it's their year. I don't know what magic potion he has used. I don't know what um, gift of gab he has that just makes Dallas Cowboy fans feel as if they're invincible before, during, and after losses. But that's really the greatest accomplishment that Jerry Jones has been able to manufacture. The fact that no one stops coming to the game, no one stops buying apparel, his team becomes more valuable as lovable losers. They weren't as valuable when they were winning Super Bowls. It's like teams that win are never the most valuable franchises. And it's kind of, I would say, interesting, uh, to say the least. Very fascinating. Man, Chicago got shamed. 29-9, to nine, they lose to the Cardinals. I saw a stat saying that um, Caleb Williams is on pace to be uh, sacked somewhere near the top ever as far as um, uh, quarterbacks are concerned. He's, I, 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 they're saying that he's on pace to be like top six, I want to say right now. I don't know that you can really blame that on the offensive line as much as I see him out there dancing and, and running in circles thinking he's going to be able to do what he did in college. Like, I don't know if he didn't get the memo. Bigger, stronger, faster. You got defensive linemen that can run as fast as you, and you sitting here running around in circles, and then we're going to blame the offensive linemen for not protecting you? I don't know. Um, with that being said, I don't believe that he is doing as poor poorly as he could be, um, but that defense is definitely keeping him in the game, the games that he that he has been in. And right now, the trend that they're going in doesn't look like the trend that they started out on. So what are your outlooks as far as Chicago is concerned, Caleb Williams is concerned? Uh, are they better off trying to put together another draft next year? Doesn't look like their version of all-in is working out today. Doesn't mean that it won't in the near future. But where are we on that? Well, because of their defense, they're a much better overall team than they were a year ago. So I, I would say they're trending in the right direction. We've spoken at length about how he was the wrong quarterback choice, but as a Commanders fan, I'm very grateful that they dropped the ball as usual. Um, but they're definitely the worst team in their division, um, although I think they're a little bit closer to the Vikings than I think maybe people – I think the 5-0 and start was a mirage, um, you know, um, but – I say all that to say that I don't usually use this term in the NFL because they're pros. This is something that typically happens more in college. But I think it was a hangover after what happened in Landover against the commanders. You you give up that Hail Mary at the, at the end of the game. That's a deflating loss. Then you have to pack up and go on another road game and play Arizona who, you know, at home is pretty decent and they have some offensive weapons there. I almost feel like the commanders beat them twice. Uh, I think we've just seen another Bryce Young moment. Um, he's a rookie. He's not playing, you know, that well. But when you see a rookie that is playing well, <clears throat> like a Jaden Daniels, now you're like, hmm. You know what I'm saying? Just like last year when C.J. Stroud jumped out the, off the porch and everybody was like, man, why you can't do what he's doing? 
And now we see him have a sophomore slump himself. I just think that uh, this rookie, rookie growing pains, he needs to learn definitely to get the ball out a lot quicker um, and not take so many sacks, you know, a couple seconds and, and, and get rid of it. Um, so I think he has to learn that part. That comes with coaching. That comes with maturity, a couple things. But I think um, seeing one quarterback play extremely well really makes the next guy not look so good, especially if he's been drafted in front of that guy. Mm-hmm. Titans over the Patriots, 20 to 17. I, I'm going to be honest with y'all. This was the happiest I've been after I lost in quite a while. Uh, the Patriots are now back in the driver's seat for the number one overall pick. I believe we already have our quarterback, but I also believe that a team that does not, we've seen time and time again, will be willing to do something very foolish. And we might be able to repair a good bit of the team in the draft by receiving compensation that we don't need for a quarterback um, and won't necessarily have to move as far down as one would think to get a haul um, for some of the guys that people are are viewing as their QB1. Uh, This year, unlike last year, we have several guys that We've seen in the past, although there's a consensus, it might not always work out the way that, you know, we, we think it may. But there's a few guys that are supposedly can't miss or worst case scenario, they'll be above average. So I can see a lot of teams coming and knocking. That's where my biggest hope is right now. Um, show that we have something to build on. So there will be a few free agents that maybe wouldn't mind us signing over a nice little check but then also be in position to be able to capitalize on this year's draft where a lot of the pieces that will fall because of who wants quarterbacks, maybe we can get right there at the top of that piece of the list and get someone that we would have been willing to take with the first overall pick if we weren't going to pick a quarterback anyway. So that's kind of where I am. Um, Go out there, give it the good old college try. And lose within a few points. <laughs> this is kind of the best thing that the Patriots can do right now. Um, but what do you guys think as far as um, the Titans and as far as the Patriots are concerned? They're both at that tail end of the NFL where I know players never want to hear the logic in losing, but I can see GMs and, and, and even coaches whose jobs are solidified. It's another big difference. Um, looking at things a different way where you kind of want to see what you have in other guys. Um, you never want to mail it in, but how close are we to that at this point? Again, another week, I thought Derek may look pretty decent. Um, also showing again that he was the better choice <laughs> by making him the starter. Um, with that being said, the problem with New England is it's not a desired place to go. Um, most of y'all success have came with players that you all have drafted or maybe even made trades for the older guys when it seemed like they had another left in the tank, the Corey Dillons, the Randy Mosses of the world, guys like that that's traded to you all. But free agents hardly ever choose New England as a destination. So that's kind of where y'all have the, the issue at. And it's where you're going to have to hang your hat on. That's what Bill Belichick was able to do over these years, not only just getting – the Tom Brady pick right, but the guys like the Vince Wilfrick's right, and then just filling in as you go along. Um, I think Vince Wilford don't get enough credit as well. I think he's like the quarterback of the defense while Tom was the quarterback of the offense because if you look at those are the only two guys that never changed. Like They got paid, and, and everybody else can go. Seymour, you can go. Vrabel, you can go. You know what I'm saying? Uh you name it, everybody can go. But Vince Wilfrick stayed <laughs> and Tom stayed. It's like I got my two quarterbacks, quarterback of my offense, quarterback of my defense. Um, so that's going to be the issue with New England. Um, but, again, making this loss moves them up that board. Uh, I'm hoping Travis Hunter goes there. I can, I, I think that would be a piece that they probably can use, uh, putting with Gonzalez um, in that secondary, making it strong. And, and they do need help on the wide receiver end as well. So. Maybe you can kill two birds with one stone with that one. 
That's my take on New England. Yeah, I mean, I think both those teams, I, I look at the Titans and the Patriots much like I look at the Saints and the Panthers. Uh, they're just really bad teams. You know, they have a lot of holes. They they have a lot of room for improvement. Um, Vander hit everything. I just I agree with everything he said. Um, New England has the opportunity here to get a top pick, and they can either select the best player there, or they can trade down and try to um, take advantage of teams that need quarterbacks. But to your point, Zay, something they haven't done well the last few years under Belichick that they need to get right now is they're going to have to draft better. Like they can't miss like they have been. They have to hit probably three out of every four picks to get back where they need to be. Like they can't go one for four, oh for five, or they need to improve drafting exponentially. Completely agree. Now, let's talk about some good teams. So it seems like the teams that were kind of active towards the trade deadline, which is now come and going, were some of the better teams. The Lions added to their defense. Um, we all know Hutchinson got hurt. They added Zaria Smith, who was a, a great fit coming from Cleveland. The Ravens added to their secondary, adding a veteran there with Tredavious White. Kansas City added DeAndre Hopkins, who all of a sudden seems to know how to play football again now that he has a good coach and a good quarterback. Go figure. Pitt, they just made a trade this afternoon for Mike Williams. Uh, we we heard all the fuss about the Cooper Cups of the world possibly moving. I guess no one wanted to pay a second-round pick for um, an aging and oftentimes ailing wide receiver. Out of these teams – not not necessarily just looking at the record, but looking at if we're starting from today, looking at the new pieces, looking at how things could come together. Who's the who, who's in the driver's seat of these teams? I think for me, the two moves that really drew my attention is. Look, I know Kansas City's unbeaten the defending champs, but the rich got richer. The fact that they got Hopkins for a fifth round pick. And I mean. I think he's just actually motivated to play. Now that he has a win, he's on a winning team, a great team, like he's motivated and look out. Like that's crazy how good their offense got in a hurry. Um, but the other one that really, and I know this sounds biased, but the commanders getting Lattimore was a huge move. Because yeah, was- I, I left that out. My bad. I, I, the, the Washington commanders – Ended up getting uh, Marshawn Lattimore, cornerback from the Saints. Absolutely. You know, of course, I wasn't going to let that one go, Zay. <laughs> Don't you worry. But, um, but I say that to say because it goes back to what Vander's been saying. You know, the commanders with, with their rookie salary cap at, at quarterback, they don't have to pay Daniels much. And this team, I don't think anyone expected them to be 7-2. and two. So the fact that they're winning games and they're leading the division and they're they're likely going to make the playoffs. It's now a two team division between them and the Eagles. They got a 50 50 chance now to win the division. They're going to be able to load up, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Quinn's going to be able to get his guy like this is a great move for them. It, it really helps their defense. To me, that was the home run move of all the teams because it addressed the need and made them a lot better. Nah, man, I, I got to agree with that. Um, I like that move, not only for this year, but next year, maybe years to come, while they packing on this defense, taking advantage of that rookie quarterback salary. Um, that's huge. I mean, um, he's one of the better corners in the league. And for a fifth-round pick, is it a fifth round pick they got him for? Was it yeah, a fifth it, round? It was a it was a mid to late round pick. They, they, I think they, it was they a fifth round pick. Like <laughs> Trust me, there's nobody in the fifth round coming out of college right now that's playing like this kid. Um, but one of the better moves that you didn't mention, I like the Steelers getting Preston Smith. I think this is a really good football move. So I don't care about Mike Williams. He he doesn't really move the needle. 
But this defense, who's already probably one of the better defenses, yeah. even got even richer. Uh, another pass rusher to go alongside uh, T.J. Watt. So that's going to be insane. Um, again, like B.K. said, D. Hop plays. He seemed motivated. It's like a a, a, a a match made in heaven. The best quarterback he's ever played with, and now he's playing with a little more spry, a little more pep in his step. And um, I mean, with them having Rice go down, Juju, and I, I mean, you just throw in D. Hop. I mean, Hollywood Brown went down. Like a lot of their weapons been gone this year. Now they just throw in another Pro Bowl. Well, wide receiver for a fifth round pick. I mean, go figure. I can tell you this. If Kansas City figures out a way to win a Super Bowl this year, it feels like it's their most tumultuous year as far as injury is concerned and trying to figure out on the fly how to make it work. But to be this far into the season with all of that going on around you and to and to be undefeated at this be the only undefeated team in the NFL and now you just got better. Um, I don't know that Hollywood will be out for the year, so they they may see him at some point during the year. Um, they were saying that the running back, Isaiah Pacheco, he could make it back for a playoff run. Uh, so that they're, they're, they're looking to actually get better at some point in time, and with their start, they're, they're just about guaranteed to make the playoffs no matter what happens going forward. We, we could be talking about a team for the ages by the time this year is over. I don't believe they'll go undefeated into the playoffs. I just think something quirky will happen at some point in time. Not betting against them, but I'm just saying I, I kind of feel like something you know, out of the norm will happen and just like, really, that's the team you choose to lose to? But I, I don't know. I, I kind of got to – I'm starting to get that team of destiny sort of thing going on with, with Kansas City as far as three-peat. And, 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 and both of you are, are NFL almanacs. Correct me if I'm wrong. No one has ever actually three-peated, right? Um, yeah. The Dallas Cowboys, right? No. They did th- I don't think they did three or four. Cowboys oh, won three or four. Yeah, they won two losses. Then um, my boy from Oklahoma came and coached and got the other one. Barry Switzer. So, was yeah. Was it like 93? Yeah. Uh, 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 I think it was 92, 94, 92 93, 95. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. The yeah. then Redskins won in 91, and I believe the Niners got it in 94. That was, I thought, when Dion jumped ship. And well, see the, the difference, night. and the difference now between those days is free agency, and True. the power and the players. So now everybody's kind of like ring chasing, and you see Pat Mahomes. You got he's one of the best quarterbacks already of all time, and he's in his twenties, right? So he's in is he is this is in real time. And you got all, and he's taking a discount. So you got all these people who are now piling on, ring chasing. Um, and they got a GM. They got a. They have a coach that's player friendly. People don't mind going there to play with him. Um, and this, I mean, like, like you said, the rich get richer. They just pick. We didn't talk about uh, picking up Kareem Hunt. So when Pacheco did go down, they pick up a guy like a Kareem Hunt, who's already who knows the system, who's been there before. Um, actually, was a league leading rusher as a rookie. It's like it just. But again, the two things stay constant. Pat Mahomes and my boy on um, Brain Freeze. Coach, the defensive tackle. Say again? The defensive tackle. Uh, Chris Jones. Chris Jones. Yeah. Those two remain the same. People can move around. Those two ain't going nowhere. Okay. I see what you're saying. So same Chris point. Jones is the best DT in the NFL. You got the best quarterback in the NFL. So the two quarterbacks on each side of the field, they remain – we seen Sneed go, you know what I'm saying? He was one of the best corners of the league last year. So guys can interchange and move around, but those two pieces remain the same. So I think as long as they have those two pieces. I think the other thing I just wanted to add with the Chiefs is the scary thing is they're undefeated. And I don't even think they've played great by their standards. Like they've they've really kind of been sloppy at times and let teams hang around. Like, the sad part is they can play a lot better. And when they do, 
I don't know if they're just kind of pacing their self through the regular season and kind of waiting for the playoffs, but like this team can play better. And when they do, that's bad news for everyone else in the NFL. People definitely haven't took advantage of the poor play of Mahomes thus far this year. He's been playing pretty poorly. Played pretty decent last night, but um, most of the year he's been not playing very well at all. So you're right about that. And I and I don't know if that's a you know a chicken or the egg type situation because everyone that he thought he was going to be throwing the ball to is, is pretty much not there other than Kelsey. Even the running back that he thought he'd be throwing the ball to out of the backfield isn't there. So the fact that with all this going on, they can still figure it out once they actually gel. It, it it can be skipped. Like, hey, shout out to the the GM though. I don't think he get enough credit, but he's one yeah. of the best. Like his drafting, he his dude is a he's 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 a menace. He's a menace. Like he 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 drafts extremely well. The only mistake, well, not only, but the the glaring mistake made. What if they had drafted Jonathan Taylor instead of Clyde Edward Hilaire? If if they had done that. <laughs> I, they may already have their three peat. <laughs> like it, 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 could, it could be that deep if they had it done. Or for that matter, I, and this ain't on the GM. What if Kareem Hunt had never gotten trouble? Like, like it's it's so many things that have twisted or turned on this team, and they were still upper echelon. Like it, it's if you love the game, you even if you don't like the team, you can't help but love what they're doing with their. Uh, front office and gameplay. So got to love that. Moving on to college. There were a few games that uh, they were pretty interesting. I'll say that fascinating for sure. We have our first official college football playoff rankings. We'll talk a little bit about both real quick here. Ohio State fins off Penn State 20 to 13. BK, I know we won. I know we won. I still don't feel comfortable with the coach. I just don't. Like, I, f- I feel like the team plays scared or nervous or whatever you want to frame it. But th- this is a game that could have easily gone the other way if the other coach didn't do what he always does when he goes against this particular team, which is make bad decisions at the worst possible time. So what is your overall take on this particular game? So I think the game really went as I expected it to, um, in the sense that the better team won. Ohio State has more talent than Penn State. And look, while Coach Day was 1-7 in seven against top five teams, James Franklin at that point was 1-9 in nine against the Buckeyes and had lost seven in a row. And four of those times, including on Saturday, they blew a double-digit lead. They were up 10 nothing after the pick six. You know, and I also said that Howard was due for a game where he wouldn't play great. He's had these games at K-State. That pick six was an awful decision and throw. You know, you, you just gave them six. But – I say all that to say that their game plan was actually pretty good. Remember, the team up north, how do they always beat Penn State? They run the ball and gash them on the ground. What did Ohio State do a ton on Saturday? They ran, they ran, they ran, and they ran some more. Junkins had a good day. Henderson had a good day. They were able to run the ball and control the line of scrimmage, which was the key to the game. Now, look. At the end of the day, Penn State did more to lose that game than Ohio State did to win the game. I mean, look, you score six points at home, and because remember, the defense got you seven, right? You changed your offensive coordinator because the other guy was trash. You bring in the new guy. He's supposed to be the chosen one. Six points at home. Like, what are we doing? No surprises here. I mean, I thought Penn State hobbled in. Um, they caught a bit. He did show that he can run the ball a little bit early, um, but still, offense out of sync. I mean, you're playing against probably the best defensive team in college football, honestly. Um, but let's see when Indiana comes to town, what's really going on. So then you can really 
draw your conclusion on Ohio State is if you think the coach is right or not right. Because in a couple of weeks, I know they got Purdue. I think they got Northwestern. Um, but when Indiana comes to town, that's the game I really got to circle on my schedule. Vander, since you brought it up, I'll, I'll go there next. Indiana, 47-10 to 10 over Michigan State. And I'm going to be 100% honest with you. And I've been saying this all year. BK, you can vouch. Indiana, they're not getting the respect that they deserve, but they might just be one of the best teams in the country. Like, they, they're really, truly great on defense and on offense. They have a good passing game, good running game. They can basically beat you wherever your weakness is. Honestly, Indiana, that game was higher on my radar than Penn State. I think that Indiana, if I'm not mistaken, do they play Michigan this week, if I'm not mistaken? Um, yeah. I I don't even know if that'll be a good litmus test for Indiana because I don't think Michigan is, is very good at all. But I expect for them to beat Michigan by double digits. Yeah, well, Indiana is the Miami Hurricanes, right? You're undefeated by circumstance. Favorable schedule. Are you really that – who you think you are? I don't know. I I I wouldn't. The only reason I wouldn't compare it to Miami is because Miami went up against several teams that, based on that game, they should have lost. I can't say that about any of Indy's. Yeah, games. but what 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 team has Indiana beat of significance? Their schedule's been Charmin soft. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you you beat Michigan State. They, they they've beaten the teams that have been put in front of them. But what I'm saying is Miami should have lost to several no-name teams. Absolutely. So to compare, to compare them, they, they beat up on everyone that they should beat up on. Miami should be defeated. Is, is all, that, that's the only but, difference. But, again, Miami has played some close games, but they was the favorites in those games as well. So, yeah, they played down to some guys and right. let some guys. They, they made the a team time, that, they should, that shouldn't have looked as good as they looked look good against them. Right. Look, I'll say this. Everyone that's Indiana, supposed to be bad look bad. I'll say this. Indiana's a better team than Miami because yeah. they play both sides of the ball and they have a better coach. Their coach will tell you, and he's right, everywhere he's been he wins. All he does is win. You know, and we already know Cristobal. I mean, he's dying. I can't wait to watch on ESPN all, all week the replay of last year's Georgia Tech-Miami game since they got God Tech this week, how he forgot to take a knee. Can't wait to watch that 13 times. So, look, Miami should have two losses for sure. The refs cost them one, saved them one game. Cal's and Epnis saved them another game. You can't blow a three-touchdown lead at home in the fourth quarter. That just can never happen. But Indiana, the thing I will say about – the one thing I look for when you play a soft schedule is not only are you winning – but you're beating the hell out of teams. They came from 10-0 down, 47 nothing run at Sparty. And look what they did in Nebraska. Remember the same Nebraska team that the Buckeyes barely beat and should have lost to? They had 42 in the first half at home on the Huskers. Like, they are – they have been really good. I've been very impressed. And they're not getting the credit they deserve because kind of like Vandy – where they're never usually good at football, people keep waiting for the slipper to fall. Yeah. So let me ask you a quick question, uh, hypothetically. So how do you feel if Ohio State takes them to the back of the woodshed? Then then what's your feeling on, on a team like Indiana? Is it going to be, well, yeah, well, they finally played somebody. That's what they – like how are you going to feel at that, at that moment? I would honestly feel – if they get run over, now I ain't talking about a close game. I'm talking about get smacked by Ohio State. If Ohio State ran over Indiana, <laughs> I still don't think that I would look at them as being fraudulent. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I can't base everything off of one loss. And if you're still at the end of the day or at the end of the season, a one loss team, and that's the team that you lost to. I can't hold that over your head, but so high. There have been teams that have been ranked higher than you that have taken losses that they shouldn't have taken. 
I, I would be, I, I, I'll say it like this. I would be more impressed that Ohio went up against a team that is firing on all cylinders and shut them down. Then I would be deflated about Indy not beating Ohio State. That that's kind of how I would look at it. So for me, I look at it like this, right? Ohio State has more talent than Indiana. Like they should beat them. Like and it shouldn't be that competitive. No disrespect to Indiana, but Ohio State has talent all the way across the board. Like this is a loaded team. They haven't played like it, but right. they right. have, you know, and there's reasons for that beyond just the coach. But if they beat Indiana, I think both things are true. I think Ohio State would prove that they can win a meaningful game. And if they look good doing it, give them credit. But I also give Indiana, I'm not going to penalize them when they're outclassed. You know, like the expectation is if Ohio State plays Indiana, there's such a talent discrepancy, Ohio State's supposed to win. Any other outcome would be shocking to everybody. But it doesn't diminish. And look, make no mistake, Indiana's a great story. They're not a contender and they're not a championship team. But I think that for them to be, what, 8-0 and ranked in the top 15, that's something that's ne- only happened one other time in history where they were 8-0. I think it's more to me about giving them credit for having a great year regardless of the team because they still have to go 8-0, right? And and so um, I, I just think they're going to have a tough time against the Buckeyes. Another surprising outcome, South Carolina over Texas A&M, 44-20. Is this more about where South Carolina is going, or is it more about where Texas A&M thought they should be but obviously aren't? Van, to start us out on this one. Who surprised? I mean, I told you. (laughs) We talked about this last week. I was like, yo. This team has played some – play LSU. They should have won. Play Alabama to the door. Um, Ole Miss is probably the only game they really lost. I mean, like really got smacked up. I mean, and again, we spoke about 80,000 screaming. And we and like BK saying Willie B's, you know what I'm saying? You got 80,000 screaming down there in, in Columbia. Like that's not an easy place to win. I told you. You hear that chicken screaming all night long. And this is the outcome. You know what I mean? It's not an easy place to win. It's homecoming weekend. Everybody home. Man, I, I'm not surprised. I mean, um, if, Ohio, if, if Texas ain't in one, I'd be like, okay, that's cool. But I'm not one of those people that's like blown away because South Carolina won because this team has been playing good teams well this season. Um, so... Hey, I don't know what to say. I'm not surprised by it at all. Yeah, I, we've talked about it. Williams Bryce, especially at night, is a very, very tough game. game. Plus, Carolina's coming off a bye, so they had extra time to prepare. And you know they watched Marcel Reed carve up LSU the week before so they were very well prepared for all the little read option games and things that they were doing that LSU got caught with their pants down Carolina was prepared for that the other thing too is you know it's a natural letdown spot for AM, right and this is take nothing away from Carolina because they outplayed them and deserved to win and on this day they were the better team there is no question but a m had that comeback win the previous Saturday at home in the battle of two conference unbeatens. They beat LSU. And look, South Carolina is not the cachet, cachet that LSU or Bama or Georgia are. That You get up more for that game, and then they had to come back on the road 
for a team that was ready to pounce on them. And they did. And the thing that I was most proud about of Carolina is remember how they pissed away that lead, double did two double digit leads against LSU and lost. They pissed it away again Saturday night, but you know what they did? They came back with a vengeance and closed on a 27, nothing run. That's a team that learned from that mistake and the heartbreak of giving that game to LSU They weren't going to let that happen again. Give Carolina credit for a great game plan. They played really well. They took advantage of what I like to call home cooking. And um, it's great to see them play to their capability. Because remember, as Vander pointed out, I'm going to add one game. They've really only played bad two games this year. The game that Sellers was nervous, this first game against ODU where he played bad and they played bad and looked terrible. And then against the old Miss game, they they crapped themselves in the first half. But outside of that, this team's played really well all year long. Got to like what they're doing. And let's take a quick look here as we wrap up the show with the first official college playoff ranking. So we know that there'll be 12 teams in the playoffs. So we'll go through about the top 15. Um, just so you guys know who's where, I want you two to tell me if there's anyone that you feel should be in that isn't, and if there's anyone who is in that shouldn't be. We know as far as where teams actually rank, that that's really neither here nor there, my humble opinion. If, if you're in, you have a chance to win. Um, but let's take a look at what we have here. Uh, number one is Oregon. Number two, Ohio State. Uh, Oregon is nine and oh, Ohio State seven and one. Georgia, number three at seven and one. Miami is number four at nine and oh. Texas is number five at seven and one. Penn State is number six at seven and one. Tennessee, number seven, seven and one. Indy, nine and oh, number eight. BYU, eight and oh, number nine. Notre Dame, number 10, seven and one. Alabama, number 11, 6 and 2. Boise State, number 12 at 7 and 1. And let's go up to 15. SMU is 8 and 1 at 13. Texas AM is 7 and 2 at 14. And LSU is 6 and 2 at number 15. Do any schools kind of stand out to you as possibly um if they're egregiously low or high, um, we can speak to that. But any teams that are on the cusp of being in that you're surprised aren't in? Uh, no. Uh, I, I like exactly how it's laid. Okay. Because at this, it's, at, it's at a point where people are going to play themselves out or play themselves in at this point. Because um, if you look under 15, a lot of those teams are – they don't deserve to be in the top 15. So – I mean, you can maybe switch a guy around here or there, maybe have LSU up a spot and flip with A&M or, you know, little things like that. But as far as the top 15 teams, I think it's perfect um, with championship games amongst, you know, coming around the, come around the circle. You know, it's going to be SEC championship, ACC, Big 12. It's, it's, it's going to work its way out at this point, if you deserve to be in or not. So I don't have any issues at all. Um now, of course, you know, Boise State, mm, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Who are they really going to play? But you got to have at least one of those kind of guys in there. You got to have a Cinderella in there somewhere. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm actually very pleased with this thus far. I think there's a couple things that drew my attention. Uh, the first thing is Tennessee at seven. You know, I'm not sure where, what they've done to merit being a top 10 team. Um, I would put Indiana ahead of them as an undefeated team. BYU has a series of quality wins where not only did they have quality wins, remember, they boat race Kansas State. I'm not sure what win Tennessee, amongst others, 
but I'm not really sure what Tennessee's done. When they have won, they've won ugly lately. Ever since they got into conference play, they've really struggled. And the other team that has my has drawn my ire is Pitt. Like Pitt has absolutely played and beaten nobody the whole season, and then get absolutely annihilated. By an SMU team, by the way, I told you all year was going to be really good, right? SMU destroyed them. How is Pitt in the top top twelve or top fifteen? No, Pitt, Pitt, Pitt is eighteen. Pitt is not. Pitt is but, at eighteen, so they're in the top twenty, but not the top fifteen. I would, I they don't even belong to be ranked. I agree. Like they haven't done anything just because you play a bunch of lousy teams and barely win those games does not mean that you should be ranked. Then on top of that, you the one game you've actually had a chance to show that you're a competent team, it was a no contest. So SMU could have beat them as bad as they wanted to. That's how bad it was. They were lucky they didn't put 70 on them. That's how bad it was. Like I, I can't believe they're in the top 20. I have them for me. My, my list have them at 23. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong poll, but the list I'm looking at have them at ranked at 23. Um I'm showing them at seven and one. That's showing that they dropped five spots to 23. Say again. Um, that's showing that they dropped to they dropped five spots to number 23. But I mean the answer to the Tennessee question, you're in the SEC. So you're always going to get that, you know what I'm saying? They're throwing one in conference play. They're always going to get a little bit of a boost ahead of the uh, the ACCs or the Big 12s of the world. So, And real quick, Vander, what I did too is, so I'm looking at the playoff rankings, not the AP or coaches poll. So mm-hmm. the playoff rankings has Pitt at 18, and mm-hmm. that's why I was, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. there's no – that team literally does nothing well other than play bad teams and beat them. So, you know, I, that, that, and I, you're right about the Tennessee thing. I, I just, one of the things, not to sound like all college basketball, but here it is. Who did you play and who did you beat? And then how did you look when you played those teams? And when, ever since, Tennessee killed everybody in non-conference and scored 63 and 77 and all these video game numbers. And then they got into conference play and this team is struggling to score 20 points. You know, they struggled against Kentucky at home. Like I just, I haven't seen them play a good game in a while. And to me, like at some point, if you're a top 10 team, the fact that you play in a great conference is great. But show me on the field that you belong. They don't pass the eye test. For me, a couple of teams that weren't quite where I expected them to be, I understand that Miami is undefeated, but they might be one of the worst-looking undefeated teams I've ever seen in my life. If Indy can be undefeated at 9-0 while Miami is undefeated at 9-0, and Indy has looked better in their wins, then explain to me how Indy is number eight, Miami is number four. They started off higher. So as they were winning, it was cruising, and Indiana has caught up. So you're not going to get leapfrog as long as you're winning if you're that far apart. Now, if you're closer, it may be one thing if you beat a, a big-ranked opponent. But Indiana hasn't beat anybody either. So they both run the same race. But, but no, I, I, I get that. What I'm saying is, when one team is beating everyone put in front of them handily, and we can't come close to saying that Miami has gone up against a gauntlet of teams and they should have lost several games. Again, how is it goes, it goes how back to spot Vander's, higher. But it goes back, it goes back to what Vander said before, which is this is why I can't stand we have preseason rankings. Because <laughs> in the preseason, they foolishly put Miami way higher than they should have been. There you go. And Indiana has outperformed what anybody. Oh no, no, no! Don't, don't don't understand. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I understand the system, but the the question in the rankings are, who is in a spot that is far far and away, in our humble opinions, 
differently than they should be. So I mean, me, I can't, I can't really not man because even though they play close games, they still winning, and teams around them have been right, losing. Right, right, right. But again, what I'm saying, and I agree with that, just on the same page. Yeah. But my point is, if another team who has played the same type of schedule right. has run away with every victory, how are they not closer? Again, like BK said, preseason rankings. They, I don't think Indiana was was Indiana even ranked. I, I get that. We're, so, we're on the same page with that. But, but, what, but what that's how, is. but that's how it works. You gotta crawl your way to the top. So just to clear up something about the playoff rankings, because I think this part's important. The top four teams are the projected conference winners of each of those conferences. So because Oregon's number one in the Big Ten, there can't be two Big Ten teams in the playoff committee's top four. It has to be the top team in the Big Ten, the top team in the SEC, the top ACC team, and the top Big 12 team are the top four. So if Indiana's that's not true. Oregon that's and Ohio State are both in. They're in the top 12, but only one team can be in the top four. Which no. Oregon and Ohio State are one and two. No. Yeah, they are. Not in the play, not in the playoff rankings. Yeah, they are. Oregon is number one. Ohio State is number two. I'm looking at it. Then they did it wrong. That that may be true, but what I'm because looking at is Oregon number one, Ohio State number two. Hey, Ohio so State. So they, they definitely say again. So so but, but no. they definitely did it wrong because at the end of the day, when it comes to the final rankings, the conference winners are one through four. Yeah. Oh, so, so that's, that's how to end up then. Like, like th this is just based on who they think are the better teams, but the conference championships will all work themselves out. So I, I see what you're saying, BK, but they, they won't rank it that way going into the championships. It'll be ranked that way after the championships, though. I see what they're what they're doing now is they're taking the top twelve teams essentially in their estimation. But when it comes to the playoffs, unlike unlike the old playoff system where the conference champion was only a tiebreaker if teams were deemed equal or not unequivocally better, right? In this situation. The top team in the country will be the number one rated team from one of the who wins the conference title of one of those four. So at this point, Oregon's the number one team in the Big Ten. They were one. In this case, number two would be Georgia because they're the top team in the SEC. Number three would be Miami because they're the top team in the ACC. And BYU would be number four because they're the undefeated team in the Big 12. If those teams won the conference, that's yeah, how. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. That makes so. So basically, what what's happening is they're giving themselves a lot of leeway for the teams that they think should be in, although they didn't win their conferences. Is basically what's going on here. Uh, but I think SMU should be some. I, I think SMU should be somewhere a lot closer to where. Um, Miami is. I think they look. They've looked better in the ACC than Miami has thus far. But they did take that one L. Um, but right now uh, they're at number thirteen. Uh, I wouldn't do too much of a flip flop. Maybe switch them out one spot for now. Boise State on the outside looking in. SMU at number twelve. Outside of that, and, and that's just because. If you're in a Power Five conference and you're putting up the numbers like against teams like Pitt that you said, that should probably give you a little bit of an edge over a Boise State and the fact they played one additional game, so they're eight and one while Boise State is seven and one. So that additional victory theoretically should be weighted the same or higher than the one loss that both teams has had. Outside of that, I can kind of see this working out exactly like you said, BK. Um, I what I don't know, I don't know if Oregon and Ohio State are in the same side of the Big Ten as far as 
I forgot what they call it, like legends and something else, whatever the, the heck they call it. But I don't know that they'll go up against each other in the Big Ten championship. So they can because there's they no can. division. There's no division. They, they got rid of divisions. I did not know that. Thank you very much. What about in the SEC where we have we have Georgia, we have Texas, and we also have Alabama um, that are all right there. How does that work out? Um, let's say none of those three teams take another loss. Who ends up in the SEC championship? Which which side, divisional sides, how's that divided up? And actually, uh, Tennessee as well. Who's higher than Alabama right now? Well, I, I'm going to say something that Vander usually says. So I'm going to steal his thunder, I think, here. <laughs> but the, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work itself out, right? Alabama plays LSU this week. They play okay. Tennessee down the stretch. So okay. these teams okay. are going to play de facto playoff games down the stretch and knock each other off. Gotcha. Gotcha. So to quote to quote one of your favorite sports say it's kind of going to be like the WNBA it's going to be winner go home like that's pretty much what it's going to be for those those teams because yeah. in the SEC there's there's no divisions there either they it's got the I didn't realize that all the conferences got rid of the divisions yeah it's because they want the two best teams to play in the conference title game the ACC mm-hmm. did that the SEC, the Big Ten, the Big 12, it's all one division now because, again, you want the best teams to play for the title. One thing that I can see happening is Notre Dame may be on the outside looking in because they can't play in the, in the division um, or in a conference championship. Right now they're at number 10. But if records hold serve, um, a, a couple of these teams will play against each other. So, as you said, that'll kind of come out in the wash. But I don't know. Notre Dame will end up being like right at number twelve, and they sneak in with that one loss, or they may be on the outside looking in because someone else who made it to the conference championship and has the same record and look good there, that making it to the conference championship can't be held against them based on the fact that Notre Dame didn't have to play in. Um, so I'm going to do something, Zay, that the committee does not like to do. Okay. I'm going to project ahead. Here's the problem with Notre Dame, and this is why I ultimately I think they're going to miss the playoffs. They're not in a power conference. They're an independent. They don't have a conference title game, so they don't have that boost there. Look at their look at their schedule. They're going to play a Southern Cal team at the end of the year, which was supposed to be a big game that they're going to probably have four or five losses. Right? That's not going to help them. Navy was supposed to be a good win this year. Not that you projected that coming into the year, but right. coming into last week or a couple of weeks ago, and Notre Dame pasted them. And then the worst part for Navy or for Notre Dame fans is. Not only did Notre Dame pace Navy, but you see Navy follow that up with a loss last week, too, to an awful team. So now they've lost two in a row, and they still got to play Army. So I say that to say that they're not going to have any quality wins unless Army runs the table. And I know, because I know where Vander's probably going to go with this, too, is as great a story as Army's been, name one quality win that they have. It ain't really it's, about the quality win. It's where they rank. They currently what, like eighteen? Twenty five. Oh well, see, I'm not thinking they got eighteen. So it's it's for, a rank. For, for the playoff rank, the, the coaches poll and the um, playoff ranking are, are a little different. Okay, so they're ranked, but this is Notre Dame. They, they've been independent. This is what they do. They pick and choose who they want to play, how they want to play. But don't forget. Notre Dame gonna put butts in the seats as well. Um, you can't forget that. I think when they are determining some of these playoff things, and the teams above them still have to play each other. So long as they keep winning and y'all beating each other up ahead of us, Ohio State got to play Indiana. 
those both of those teams are ahead of them. So when one of those lose, guess where they're gonna go? Behind them. They're not gonna be in front of them. I think they rank like 10 right now, Notre Dame. So Indiana I think if Ohio State wins, Indy goes behind them. If Ohio State loses and we still only have one loss, and Indy will then be a but they will have two yeah. Ohio State will have two losses if they lose. It won't be one, it'd be two. Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm saying if Ohio State wins and Indy loses, Indiana goes behind Notre Dame. I, I don't I don't know if they will because they, they, they got they to be eleven, but but hear me out. Right now, Indy is ranked eighth. And if they're eleven and, 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 and Notre Dame is what, 10? Uh Notre Dame is 10. Yeah, you you you're going behind. That's only two no, spots. Let, let, let me finish. What I'm saying is if Indy ranked eighth or higher, depending on what happens in these next couple of weeks. Loses to the number two team. I don't see them shooting back to thirteen. Well, how far you think they're gonna drop? Two spots? No. Pretty much. No. How, how no. far you think they should drop when you lose to the number two it, team? It, it won't be two spots. That's <laughs> it what we That's what I'm saying. As a late it be two spots. Somebody. Notre Dame must think, jump right in front of them. But I think it depends on what happens that week, right? Like, because it's all relative and in a, it's all a fluid situation. What if, what if it happens to be one of those crazy Novembers where we see, like, especially you see this all the time, like 15 and below in the top 25, you'll see like six of those 10 teams, 15 all to 25, top. lose. So if they all lose that week, it's going to help Indiana a lot more than if they're the only one who loses or one of a few teams that lose. I think what everyone else does around them will impact their, how far they drop. And the sure. other part is, and the other part is what was the margin of victory? If Ohio state beats them 24 to 21, then no, they won't. Notre Dame won't jump them. If they both have one loss and Notre Dame's loss was to Northern Illinois, who by the way is awful, then no, they won't jump them. However, if they get pasted 41 to 10, you can bet Notre Dame's jumping. Well, this is my thing. If Indiana is eight and Notre Dame is ten, I don't care if it's if they win by three points. If you lose, you're going to drop a spot. You're not going to stay at eight and with a loss. They're going to drop somewhere. They got to go somewhere. They're going to drop one spot to if nine. They're undefeated when they get to Ohio State, they'll don't be matter. higher than eight. So, so where they going to drop to? Nine. It, it depends. They'll be higher but, than eight. So that means Notre Dame be higher than 10 because as these teams lose above, they're going to be creeping up as well, right behind them. They're going to be right on their back. Tennessee still have to play Georgia, who's seven. So if Georgia steamrolls Tennessee, they go into the back. And so Notre Dame is going to be in it whether you like it or not. It's just because of where they're positioned and who they have left to play. They're pretty much in a great spot. I mean, they don't really have to have any key wins. I mean, they but just then, then you have to add in also that. While they'll be dormant, other teams will be playing in a conference championship, and that may put somebody ahead of them that they were ahead of before the championship game. At that point, they're gonna be they're gonna be high enough to be in it. They're already ten. You gonna you gonna just drop them all the way out? No. They're already but, ten. What I'm saying is the the committee would have a tough task in saying, well, because you made it to a conference championship. And they don't even have one, and you slightly lost your conference championship. That makes you worse than the team that didn't even play in one. Dude, that that cool. will be that's going to be a difficult. They they say what they said. They said the top twelve teams in right. Yeah. What are we talking about? <laughs> what are we talking about? If they're currently ten, so 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 my point how are we going to drop out of out of the twelve? It, well, no. So, so if you have, like, say for instance, you don't think the committee would prefer to have an Alabama in than a Notre Dame? Hell no. Alabama already got two so? losses. I understand that, but they only one spot behind Notre Dame. <laughs> SMU is Alabama looks horrible. They got two losses and, and should lost to South Carolina. No, I, I get it. I get it. But there, all I'm saying is there, there are a few teams like SMU. I think it's playing better ball than Notre Dame. They just are. And no, I'm, it, I'm, I'm fine with that. But what I'm saying is they just in the, the sweet spot. They so happen to be ranked at a good spot 
Right. And, but okay. So let's say, let's say you have SMU. if they was 12 or 13 huh? right now, but, I'll but, be like but what, what happens if a SMU wins out, Miami wins out, but Miami, but Miami loses to SMU in the conference championships. Miami is going to be a top three, four team going into the championship. You got to move SMU up if they beat Miami, which I think they're fully capable of. But I don't think you can move Miami, who will then have the same one loss that Notre Dame has, behind Notre Dame. Does that make sense? I I feel what you're saying, but as long as you're winning, this is another – SMU is a team that lost already as well. They're not going to just jump over this guy, over these. This is still no, Notre Dame. that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if SMU beats a top four team in Miami in, Notre, in the conference championship and Notre Dame doesn't play anybody, like there's enough. several teams that, that are going to be at that one loss or no loss marker that are just better than Notre Dame. This, there's going to be so many people lose ahead of them. It don't, it's not going to matter because Tennessee going to probably come down by that point. Indiana probably going to come down at that point. You still got guys that's ahead of them that's going to be coming down. So it ain't going to matter anyway. They just they are lucky to be sitting where they're sitting at. They're just lucky. They're in a good spot. They don't have to do no – they can just go beat Army, beat Southern Cal Weber, and just chill. It's the end of – this is this is Notre Dame. They, this, is, this is what they do. They're independent for a reason. For these reasons, they have a big fan base, and the voters are going to make sure they have a spot. Or maybe the powers that be say, hey, if you want to join in the party, you need to join a party. It, it'll never happen because they – Notre Dame is like – they have their own network. They were remember, see, growing up, when I was growing up, Lou Holtz and all that, Rocket Ishmael, they was on NBC every Saturday. Every Saturday, Notre Dame was playing. I don't care who they was playing. They could be playing uh, Benedict. They was going to be on TV. You know what I'm saying? That's just what it was. But they kind of like control their own. They kind of like the Vatican. <laughs> they make their own laws and rules. They just they always been independent. They would never join the conference. This is this is their power. This is the reasons why. They have the they have they, they control their own destiny from year in the year out. Well, we have two weeks of regular season, then we have conference championships. And this year, I think, will be instrumental in moving to 16 teams. Because somebody's gonna be on the outside begging, and it may be a team that is very much deserving. Uh, make sure that you guys check us out on YouTube at The Gospel STP. If you haven't joined the Facebook group, it's The Gospel Sports Truth Facebook group. Make sure you check out the Fantasy Football Show on tomorrow and the day after The Gospel Sports Truth Podcast, where we go over everything that is bubbling over in the topics of sports before this evening. We out, and remember, tell the truth. And nothing but the truth.